Hi there, good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Adrienne Neidhart and I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist with Boston IVF, as well as with Delaware Institute for Reproductive Medicine or DERM, which is a Boston IVF partner clinic in Delaware. And we're here tonight doing a live Facebook question and answer session um, to try to get all of your questions answered about infertility, workup, treatment, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, I'll add a little disclaimer at the beginning that I'm absolutely going to try to get to as many questions as I can. If I am not able to get to your question, please forgive me, but we'll spend as much time as we can uh, trying to do this. Um, so let's get started. So to start with tonight, um, one of the questions I think that is very commonly asked, um, and it kind of a little bit of a hot topic in our field is, is there a better success rate seen with fresh embryo transfers versus frozen embryo transfers? And I think this question deserves a little bit of a background information to answer it. Um, the short answer is they're probably equal, that if everything is, is equal, meaning the lining looks good, there's not high risk of hyperstimulation, we have a good quality embryo, implantation and pregnancy rates are probably similar with fresh versus frozen. This is not what the case was years ago. Um, before we were able to vitrify embryos, which is a rapid freezing technique, which is associated with much higher survival and implantation rates, we it, prior to that, success rates with frozen transfers were much lower, and we had a much lower uh, survival rate when we thawed the embryos. And over the years, and now it's it's been well over a decade, um, if not closing on two, that vitrification has been widely available. It's really changed the landscape with IVF. And we find that there's a lot of advantages in doing a frozen embryo transfer. The biggest advantage is with safety, especially for the person undergoing stimulation. If you are a vigorous responder, you have high estrogen, you've got lots of eggs, and you do a transfer and you get pregnant, your risk of having ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is very high. We know if we freeze embryos and we avoid HCG, we can almost not completely eliminate the risk of hyperstim or at least decrease the severity of it. Um, freezing embryos allows us to do genetic testing of embryos if that's desired. And it also allows you to do a transfer in a natural or a modified natural cycle, which um, a lot of women prefer and may have some advantages for an ongoing pregnancy and, and the safety of it. So I think it's multifactorial. I don't think you have to sacrifice any, it, you, you only sacrifice time by freezing your embryos, um, but in a well, um, in certain circumstances, if everything else looks good, it is still reasonable to do a fresh transfer. Um, so there's a question here um, asking, does having low sperm morphology affect the ability to do IUI? And like so many things in reproductive medicine, it's a little bit of a gray zone. If you have isolated low morphology and it's minimally reduced, and there's still a good quantity of normal moving sperm in a couple that all the other factors look reasonable, meaning a decent ovarian reserve, good amount of moving sperm, anatomically normal uterus, I think it's very reasonable to try IUI first. This is an area where we're learning more and more, and there is other sperm testing that can be done, um, which is called uh, DFI or DNA fragmentation index. It's looking at the, the, the semen as a whole and looking for the percentage of the sperm that has DNA damage or fragmentation. And that has been correlated with success rates, both with unassisted conceptions and IUI. And if there's a very high DNA fragmentation, it may mean that ICSI, where you actually inject the sperm into the egg, is needed. So I'd say morphology may affect the ability for IUI to be successful. I also never make a wide sweeping conclusion from one semen analysis. And I think that's really important. I know the men, on, men out there aren't going to be happy with that because no one likes to do a semen analysis, but it's we need more than one data point because sperm is 
being made in cycles every three months. So you are going to see these natural ups and downs. And I'd say half the time when we have some mild sperm abnormalities, we repeat the analysis and that resolves. So it is part of the equation. I would take into what it into account, especially if there was no other explanation for infertility, but it doesn't automatically mean you have to go to IVF. Um, so uh, another question is, um, does prolactin levels, um, oh, I just lost. Oh, here we go. Does prolactin level in the thirties, but below the 40 affect the ability to get pregnant? And I'm assuming this means if the menstrual cycle is regular. So there is some evidence. We know the biggest impact that prolactin may, elevated prolactin may have is on ovulation. And that's where I think you're getting with, with the regular cycle. So presumably if you're having regular cycles, you're ovulating. And I don't think every, every woman who has mildly elevated prolactins who's cycling regularly is going to be infertile. But if you are infertile, you're experiencing infertility or you're having implantation failure with IVF and you don't have another explanation, I think it's very reasonable to try to treat and normalize the prolactin to help optimize implantation and pregnancy rates. So again, it's equivocal, like so many things. It's not necessarily the sole cause of infertility, but if you are already infertile and you've got consistently high prolactin levels, I err on the side of treating it to try to normalize that. Um, I have a question here that that's interesting. It, uh, it says, should my doctor be asking how many children I hope to have before IVF and would that change our protocol? Um, I think this is a great question that hopefully your doctor's asking or you are bringing up and having a conversation with your physician. Now, it may or may not change the protocol. We would like to think we have a lot of control as to what exactly happens during IVF, but we know there's probably less control than we really have, meaning we could choose a protocol that we think is going to get us kind of our target number of eggs, and we can end up with a lot more than we were expecting and a, a, a lot fewer. I think it's always a good conversation to have, not only just going into IVF, but even at your first fertility visit. What's your ideal family size? Because that might also impact how quickly you decide to move forward with different modalities. If you're 37 and you want three children, well, you might move to IVF a little more quickly because with IVF, you're going to be able to freeze, hopefully, excess embryos that are no longer going to age, and you can use those embryos for future children. And that's going to increase the odds that you're going to have the family size you want. But let's use in another example. Say you're 29 and you want one baby or one more baby. And you've got really good ovarian reserve, and so you're you're nervous. You don't want to have ten embryos in in the in the freezer when you're done, um, and so that's an important conversation to have. And although I think any reproductive endocrinologist will tell you we can't guarantee the number of embryos that you're going to wind up with, no matter what we do, but having that discussion, if you're someone who has really high ovarian reserve, I would err on the side of a much lower dose protocol or a mini stim protocol, or selectively fertilizing your eggs. These are all things that should be discussed and discussed in the context of your situation, your your fertility factors, your age, and your long-term family planning. So I think that's an excellent question and, and hopefully will help other people have these conversations with, with their physicians. Um, all right, so everyone's hitting the hot button topics tonight. So everyone knows to, to really, really uh, get at the heart of it. So there's a question, is there is there any value in receptiva testing, laparoscopy, or ERA testing? All really hot, hot button in our, in our field, but they, there's overlap, but they are looking at different things. So just to catch up people who don't know, this is typically, especially with ERA, and receptiva, we're usually talking it more in the context of IVF and looking for at the optimal time for implantation. So let's let's break these all down. So laparoscopy, what would be the value of laparoscopy? Laparoscopy has been the gold standard for diagnosing and treating underlying endometriosis or pelvic disease for decades. 
I think as IVF got more successful over the years, the routine use of laparoscopy just for diagnostic purposes really went down because success rates without having to go through that invasive step were still very good. And um, there is some evidence, especially for women who are on the older side, older reproductive side, that doing a laparoscopy laparoscopy first may just delay time to conception and treatment. So it's not automatic standard for everybody, but there are people who could absolutely benefit. Someone has pelvic pain that's unexplained or you suspect endometriosis, especially if it's disruptive to your, your quality of life, that absolutely may have a role in helping improve your pain as well as treating um, or optimizing your, your fertility. Anyone with pelvic pathology, potentially fibroids, large ovarian cysts, any intrauterine abnormalities may benefit from a laparoscopy. I think the question here that that the person who asked this is probably trying to get at is, is doing a laparoscopy maybe for implantation failure or to improve implantation during IVF helpful? And I don't think we have a good answer for that. The receptiva test, which is also asked about here, is a test to try to determine who might benefit from either a laparoscopy or medical treatment of underlying endometriosis. And endometriosis is when the lining of the inside of the uterus grows outside around it, and it causes inflammation, it can cause pain, it can cause scar tissue. And most people with underlying diagnosis of underlying endometriosis are going to have good outcomes, good pregnancy rates with IVF. There's a smaller percentage of women who with chronic inflammation with, with endometriosis, we think may result in lower implantation rates. The receptiva test is a biopsy that's taken from the lining of the uterus. It's sent to a specific laboratory and um, they look for um, a marker called BCL6. So it's a marker of inflammation that is associated either with untreated endometriosis or potentially could be seen in women who have dilated fallopian tubes like a hydrosalpinx. And their studies have shown that if this is elevated, women have lower implantation rates. So it is a tool that um, can be utilized. I don't think everybody needs it, not at all. I think it's a small subset of people either with symptoms and you're trying to decide, do I do surgery? Do I do medical treatment of endometriosis with Lupron before the transfer? The receptiva might help you answer that. Or if you're not getting pregnant when we think you should be, good quality embryos that we're putting in. The ERA is also an endometrial biopsy, it's looking at something different. It's not assessing for endometriosis, which is when the glands from the inside of the uterus are outside of it. It's trying to assess the window for implantation, meaning when you should time your transfer in relation to how much progesterone you've been on. And when this first came out, we all got really excited. The initial studies showed that it might help improve implantation rates, but more recent studies show that it's not really as beneficial as we thought. And so it's really, it's starting to kind of fall out of favor as much. There may be a small subset of women who could benefit, but it's really hard to determine who that would be. It's an expensive test. It's painful and it takes time. It just delays. So I don't recommend doing it off the bat, but if you're someone who's had implantation failure, it's certainly a, worth a conversation. And there are other things you can do with the ERA. You can look, it's called an Emma and Alice, where you can look for any um, inflammatory markers. So that was a long answer because that's a loaded question. So, it sounds so easy, but there's a lot of different, different parts to that. Um, Okay, and so a follow-up to this, the next question is, rather than doing the additional testing like the receptiva or the laparoscopy, can we be treated for presumed endometriosis? Absolutely. If there's a clinical, uh, especially if there's clinical uh, thought that you have it, meaning a woman who has unexplained infertility or painful menstrual cycles, pain with intercourse, clinical symptoms of endometriosis, and you say, listen, we're presuming you've got endo instead of doing this expensive invasive test, let's treat you. But what's the treatment? The medical treatment prior to an embryo transfer is using Lupron, which suppresses your estrogen, often along with letrozole, which further suppresses your estrogen for two to three months prior to your embryo transfer. So the idea is to turn off the stimulation to the endometriosis, calm down the inflammation, and then do the transfer. And the, la the company that does Receptiva does have some evidence that treatment like that um, does help improve implantation rates in subsequent cycles. So I do some sometimes empirically um, 
treat someone. Um, sorry. Yeah, so here's a question. Um, how often does testing come back normal, but there's still an issue? Um, and, and so someone who's relaying that their experience is that they've been trying for well over a year and um, all the testing has come back normal. I think this is one of the most frustrating things. Sadly, it is very common. At least or around 40% of couples who have infertility, meaning unprotected intercourse, for over a year period of time or over six months and someone who's over the age of 35 will fall into this bucket of unexplained infertility. Meaning all, it doesn't mean there isn't an explanation. It means there isn't a readily apparent explanation that we can identify. So on our routine tests, so routine tests, meaning looking at sperm, making sure that anatomy is normal, that there's open fallopian tubes and that there's a normal endometrial cavity, that there's decent ovarian reserve, meaning there's eggs that are there and you're releasing those eggs. And then ancillary things like making sure you're in good health, your thyroid is normal, you don't have diabetes. And 40% of couples after doing all that testing, we don't find an explanation. Sometimes during the course of, of treatment, if someone continues on treatment, something will, will become apparent, um, especially with IVF. Sometimes we'll see that, you know, fertilization rates or embryo development rates are lower than we would expect. Um, endometriosis can be a, a common cause of otherwise unexplained infertility because it can be silent in people too. So there may be a high percentage of women with unexplained infertility who you find underlying endometriosis. So it's reassuring to have normal testing because you don't want to find that there's no sperm or your ovarian reserve is very, very low, but it's frustrating, I know, not to have an answer. And fertility treatments in this situation is designed at trying to increase the percentage chance that you're going to get pregnant. And that's if we do IUIs with medication or we move to IVF, it's trying to say, all right, we, we, we don't know what the identifying initial causes, but let's try to move around it to increase the odds that you're going to get pregnant. Remember, anyone who has open tubes, their sperm, and you're releasing eggs, there's always a chance that pregnancy is going to occur. But what happens is if you've gotten to a point where you have such a low chance, a lot of time goes goes by. Um yeah, someone has a question about uh, the risk of an ectopic pregnancy with IVF. And if you had an ectopic with an unassisted or a natural conception, does the risk of another decrease of electing to do IVF versus trying naturally? Yes. So an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that occurs outside of the cavity of the uterus, most commonly within the fallopian tubes. It also could be in other locations, right at the corner of the uterus or in the abdomen but or in the cervix, but those are very rare. Um, if you've had an ectopic pregnancy with an unassisted conception, but everything else is normal, your other tube is open and your anatomy looks good, there's no other risk factors, your risk of having another ectopic is similar. It's probably in the range of about 10%. If you've had two ectopics, um, whether it's using your tubes outside of IVF, say, now your risk skyrockets. Your risk of having another ectopic becomes very high. And that's usually when we say, listen, it's time to pivot and, and try something else. IVF does substantially decrease your risk of an ectopic pregnancy, but it doesn't make it zero. Strangely enough, you know, when you do IVF, you create the embryo outside of the body. You then take the embryo and you put it right inside the cavity but the embryo sometimes can migrate back inside the fallopian tube and implant, but that only occurs about 1% of the time. So that's significantly less than it does with unassisted conceptions or with IUI. So IVF really is a treatment to help reduce the risk of further ectopic pregnancies. Um, A little shout out there um, from, from a former patient. Um, someone had asked about, we had talked a little bit about high prolactin levels and how that might affect things. And um, someone was asking about uh, low prolactin level 
below normal with cabergoline treatment. So cabergoline is a common medicine we use to lower prolactin in women. And would that affect the ability to get pregnant? I don't believe so. I don't think it, it often does go below normal once you're on the, the medication and that should not affect implantation and establishing an early pregnancy. And usually once you have a positive pregnancy test, we stop the, the cabergoline at, at that point. Um, Okay, so a couple, couple other questions. Um, how long does all of this take? Um, obviously, that's going to be different for different people. But I think one of the biggest frustrations for patients outside of having to be here to begin with and having to deal with infertility is the length of time it takes. And it tends to take a long time for various reasons. Some of it is just scheduling the appointment getting in, having the testing done, having it has to fall at a certain time of your month, life gets in the way, things happen. Then there's, you know, um, hurdles of, of dealing with insurance, depending on what state you live in and getting that approved and being able to move forward. And some of those more uh, delays that aren't associated with the infertility portion of it, but still add to the frustration, because by the time you're seeing us, you wanted to be pregnant yesterday. So it adds to it. And then you have to think of the fertility journey. It's never linear for most people. There's ups and downs, and sometimes you're going backwards before you go forwards again. And that's really difficult to, to deal with. So why I'd love to say, hey, I, I don't, the average time it takes is three months before you're here. I don't know if I could even give an average time. There are certainly people who come in, have an evaluation, do one treatment cycle, and they're they're pregnant and, and on their way. And there are other people who are two years later are into the thick of things and still going through treatment. So trying to temper your expectation that this is a journey, it's not always linear, there may be curveballs thrown at you too, may help. And then really getting the support you need as you're going through this. You know, obviously family and friends who you feel comfortable with, but sometimes having outside support, support from a therapist or a counselor, especially someone who's versed with the challenges with fertility, I think can be really valuable for, for couples who are going through this. Um, I had a question here about someone asking about considerations specific to uh, reciprocal IVF. Reciprocal IVF is what some people refer to um, uh, partner assisted reproduction is another way to say it, meaning most often seen in a female couple where we're going to utilize eggs from one partner to create the embryos and then the other partner is going to carry them. And Obviously, there's different considerations because you have everything that we're talking about in this gamut, but now you've also have two people that you're that you're getting ready for this with two different medical backgrounds, maybe different ages. Um, and everyone comes to this with a different journey. You know, sometimes a, a, a female couple may come and have no no history of infertility and isn't are you I don't consider you infertile until we've proven that there there is a problem. Uh, but in order just to go through this, I would expect that there's going to be a workup, an evaluation for both both of you, each person who wants to be involved. So the the person who wants to donate the, or, or utilize their eggs, what we really want to look at is ovarian reserve. We want to look at... Um, we always do basic um, anatomy scan, make sure we can access the ovaries, we can access the, the eggs, make sure your general health is good. You want to do genetic carrier screening. When you utilize um, sperm from a donor, whether it's an, a known donor or it's an anonymous donor, you want to make sure that your egg, the eggs you're going to use and the sperm you're going to use are compatible genetically. And when I say that, meaning that you're not carriers of the same recessive genes. And I often encourage um, female couples for both to be tested if you think that at any point you may use both of your eggs. So you kind of take all of that into consideration. Um, whenever I have a conversation with a female couple, even if even if a couple comes in knowing kind of, well, this is what we want to do. These are the eggs we want to use. This is the uterus we want to use. For a lot of people, they don't know, or that changes as we go through this and as we learn things. So I really try to have a 
whole conversation about what's your total family building look like? You know, how do each of you want to participate in that? What's that going to look like? And then we determine what kind of testing we need to do and what's the appropriate treatment. So my recommendation is come in, have a conversation before you're ready to start. So you can start thinking about some of these things um, and it'll help you with your decision making moving forward. Um, Boston IVF and uh, DERM, Delaware Institute for Reproductive Medicine, are very, very comfortable with these type of cycles, both for female couples, male couples, any, any single individuals, anyone trying to build their families. Um, So someone was asking, is there a disadvantage to doing a, a frozen embryo transfer when you're at an older age, in your early 40s, with embryos from your 30s? Is that a disadvantage? So we have to remember the biggest prognostic indicator of the likelihood of an embryo making a baby, a healthy baby, is actually the age of the egg at the time the embryo was created. And we can freeze embryos and at this time, point in time, they don't have an expiration date. So I think it was just recently in the past year to two, there had been an embryo that had been frozen, a baby born from an embryo that had been frozen for over 20 years. So from the embryo standpoint, no, there, there, there's not. And the risk of having a baby with a chromosome abnormality, the risk of miscarriage, the likelihood of implantation is related to the age that your embryo was created. Now, there can be some challenges in your 40s of of pregnancy. We can handle we can handle that. We will treat healthy women, you know, no significant underlying medical problems, especially if they're uncontrolled, you know, or, or no medical contraindications to being pregnant up until the age of 50, not with your own eggs, um, but with either your embryos that you created before or with donor egg. Now, when you're in your 40s, especially as you get to your mid to later 40s, there's an increased risk of having preterm delivery, even if you're completely healthy and there's no, you don't have hypertension, you don't have diabetes. We know that risk is higher. There can be a higher risk of developing gestational diabetes or high blood pressure, preeclampsia during your pregnancy. Um, but, you know, if you go into it as healthy as you can be and you're monitored closely, there are a lot of women who have healthy babies at that age range. So, um, that's an excellent question. Okay, I like this question. So any advantage to transferring multiple embryos versus one embryo of un, if they're untested, what are the pros and cons? So um, excellent. In, 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 the, in the US in general, over the past end of 20 years, there has been a... Um, decrease in the number of embryos that we transfer, that we're willing to transfer, and that is kind of medically acceptable to transfer. And that really corresponds to improvement in science and technology. So, you know, the success rates that we get now with a good quality embryo, especially if it's genetically tested, and I'm going to answer your question about untested embryos too, but is better than we used to get when I first came out of training and we transfer three embryos back. So a lot of it has has to do with the improvement in technology that has improved um, implantation rates of, 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 of individual embryos. Now, when you're talking about untested embryos, you really have to know the age, as I mentioned before, the age of the egg. So in women who are 35 and under, and I'd say even up to 37, I would argue, have excellent implantation rates if you've got a good quality embryo doing a single embryo transfer. And if you're 33 with an untested embryo, you know, most clinics, you're going to have a, at least a 50% chance of getting pregnant. That's, that's kind of average. Miscarriage rate is related to your age, probably 12 to 15%. Um, if you put in a second embryo, you get a slight bump in the overall chance of pregnancy, but it's not huge. It's not drastic. You don't go from a 50% chance now to an 85% chance but what you do do is you go from a 2% risk of having twins from an identical twin to now 50%. And we know even in a young, healthy person, someone who's had term babies before, twins or multiples are higher risk. They're more likely to have preterm delivery, diabetes, high, high blood pressure, complications during pregnancy and delivery for both mom and baby. We also see that 
if you look at individual implantation rate of an embryo, that a single embryo has the best chance of making it to a baby rather than when you put more than one in. So we think there may be even competition between the two. Now, again, I brought up age because if someone's 43 and you have untested embryos, we know the success rate and the implantation rate is so low that it's not unreasonable in that circumstance to put more than one embryo back, especially if it's not tested. If it's tested, I would still go by one at a time. So it really depends on, on your age. In a perfect world, you know, if, if this was all covered and nobody had to worry about how many times you do this, you know, doing one embryo at a time would be safest for, for, for everybody. Um, and I certainly know there's extenuating circumstances. Um, Uh, just a quick question that I do want to address. It's more specific to, but someone is um, asking a question about uh, recurrent chronic endometritis or not recurrent, one, uh, kind of intrinsic uh, chronic endometritis that won't go away despite different rounds of antibiotics with, with biopsies and um, asking about the Emma and Alice test, which can be done alone. It doesn't have to be done with an ERA. I would give it some, some consideration because the Emma and Alice actually identifies the bacteria. So that may help tailor the antibiotics. If you haven't already, oh, I think you said in another question, you already did the hysteroscopy. Yeah, I was gonna recommend the hysteroscopy to remove as much as the abnormal tissue as possible. The other thing they could try is maybe even seeing if they can culture and get something to grow. But the Emma and Alice can look at the DNA of the bacteria. So they may be able to identify specifically what it is. So I just um, wanted to address that. Uh, another quick question, can HPV in a woman affect the odds of conceiving? Typically, generally not. We generally don't think that that causes infertility. HPV or human papillomavirus is a virus that is almost ubiquitous in the population. We've all come in contact with it. There are higher risk forms of HPV. That's what's screened with pap smears, because if you have that in, that infection or been exposed to it and it doesn't go away, um, it can increase your risk of cervical cancer. Uh, most of us our bodies will take care of it on its own. It doesn't ascend into the tube, so that should not cause um, infertility. So I think this is a really good question to address. So um, someone asked here is how often does, is body weight the reason someone isn't able to get pregnant? Um, and I think this is, this is a, this is a very, timely. And this is something that we all deal with commonly. And I think it's something that a lot of women um, hear all the time. We do have evidence that weight, extremes of weight, so underweight, overweight can affect success rates of conceiving. Now, it's very hard to study in the general population, because how do you know who's trying, who's not trying? There's no, there's no really great randomized controlled trial that you can do just in, in nature. So we rely on looking at IVF and fertility treatments because we can look at success rates. We can see people going through. And we do know that as weight goes up or if it's extremely low, success rates do go down. But it's one factor. And I think for everybody who's trying to conceive, is there's multiple factors. There's two people with different ages, different backgrounds, different weights, different medical problems, different genetics. And it's hard to say that, geez, there's only this one thing. You know, it's just your weight and nothing else. So of course we all hear stories, especially if someone's overweight and they're not ovulating, that's different. If oftentimes if you lose weight, that'll help restore ovulation, which may help you conceive again. But I think no matter what your weight is, if you're struggling to conceive again, especially as this individual mentioned that they had conceived before and time has gone by, you deserve an evaluation, right? Like you should, you should just like anybody else be able to check all of these different parts because, you know, maybe something happened with your, your partner and his sperm is low now, or, you know, there's a polyp sitting inside the uterus. And yes, I'd ideally love everybody to be at a healthier weight and be a, a, the healthiest them possible. But I still think you deserve a discussion with the physician and an evaluation to see what's going, going on. 
Um, you know, a question that often comes off of this is, are there cutoffs in fertility worlds as to where we will or will not treat people? And it can be a little bit of a sensitive topic. Um, most of the Boston IVF clinics for IVF, when you're actually going to have anesthesia and have a procedure done, has a BMI, BMI weight requirement of 45 or below because we're doing anesthesia in the office. But we don't prevent anybody from having an evaluation, a consultation, and appropriate treatment with, within that, that guise. So again, it's one little marker in, in a whole person. And um, there's other indications of someone being healthy, not healthy, everything like that. So try to be the healthiest you possible. And if it's if it's been a while, if it's been over a year or even over six months, you've been trying to conceive again, come and have an evaluation. Um, so this gets back to another question. So I, um, again, but just I'm going to ask, why not include diagnostic for endometriosis and baseline testing in couples with unexplained infertility? We used to do that. So I don't want to date myself, but a long time ago when I was a resident, anyone with unexplained infertility had a laparoscopy to look for endo. Well, yes, you get an answer. Most of the time it was very minimal endometriosis and it was very hard pressed to say that was treating that endo actually helping things? Maybe it helped improve natural conception after that. But as fertility treatments got more successful and were less invasive than surgery, that fell from the wayside as far as something that everybody has to do. I think taking everyone to surgery, putting them to sleep under general anesthesia and putting an instrument in, which is the only way to 100% diagnose endometriosis, you would do more harm than good if you, if you standard did that for everyone. Receptiva also isn't perfect. Receptiva is looking for a marker of inflammation. And so while if it's present, there's a high chance you have either endometriosis or hydrosalpinks in your tubes. I've seen women with severe endo have negative receptivas too. So it's a tool. It's going to be, I think, different for everybody. And and that's why it's not standard of care. Because I wish, I wish there was a blood test or a simple uh, one MRI that that we could do um, that could conclusively diagnose or rule out endo. But unfortunately, it doesn't exist. Um, so someone asked about if you only have one fallopian tube, what are your chances of getting pregnant? Really, it depends on why you only have one fallopian tube. So if if you had a um, ectopic pregnancy and a fallopian tube is removed, but the pelvis otherwise looked normal. The other tube looks normal. Um, you're, you know, reasonably young um, and everything else looks normal. You should have the same chance of getting pregnant if you don't have infertility. Now, if you're missing a tube um, or the other reasons why one would be gone, um, sometimes I've had people who've had an ovarian cyst or torsion of the tube and a technically speaking, your fertility should be the same. Now, often this goes along with fertility though. So if you're missing a fallopian tube and there's other factors, there's any problems with your ovarian reserve or the sperm, we're going to take that into account. Um, but as long as the other tube is normal, you can still try to use it. Um, So there was a question about what kind of tests are done before starting an IUI with um, donor sperm. I think this is going to vary a little bit with the doctor that you see um, and kind of what your wishes are. I minimum, I want to do, um, you know, I usually do an ultrasound because that gives us an idea about your anatomy. I want to look at your ovarian reserve. Um, genetic carrier screening, as, as we talked about, which I'll piggyback on that and talk a little bit more to make, to help you appropriately identify a low risk donor. And then some sort of an evaluation to make sure your tubes are open. There are some docs in a low risk individual who will say, listen, we don't have to do that. If you don't get pregnant after a couple months, then we'll go back and do it. Because yes, the truth is if you are, if you're low risk, meaning you haven't had any um, abdominal surgery, you haven't been treated for any sexually transmitted diseases, the chance that your tubes are blocked is low, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a big deal if they are, right? If you go through three IUIs and the cost of donor sperm, if you're using an anonymous sperm donor, even if you're using a known one and you're, you're paying to have that person uh, screened every time, it's a lot to go through a few months and then find out, oh my gosh, my tubes are blocked and I'm, I'm or I've got a huge 
polyp or fibroid in my uterus and, and these weren't going to work. I look at it as far as let's make sure the basic things are there so we know that you have a good chance of being successful. So that's kind of the minimum. I do want to piggyback off on that because I know this has come up a few times and it's a, um, a commonly misunderstood concept. So when I've brought up uh, genetic carrier screening, um, this is different than screening your embryos. So when you're doing IVF and we talk about testing your embryos and doing what's called PGTA, that's looking at the embryos, the chromosomes. Genetic carrier screening is, ca is screening the egg and the sperm, that individual, for any recessive genes. All of us carry recessive genes. There's thousands of them out there. If you have a recessive gene mutation, for an example, cystic fibrosis, um, if I have that, I'm not going to have any symptoms of the of, of the disease. I may not have any family history either because it's recessive. You need two copies of it. But if I carry it and now my partner carries it, 25% of our children are going to get two copies. And in certain diseases, it may be lethal, uniformly lethal. And so for couples who, the heterosexual couple who's conceiving on themselves, we offer this testing because some couples would like to know that ahead of time, especially if they're going to go through IVF. Because if you knew you were both carriers of the same condition, you can test your embryos. It's PGT. M mutation screening to make sure the embryo you put in the uterus is not affected with the disease. In someone who's using donor, donor sperm or donor eggs, anonymous eggs and sperm donors are all screened with a genetic carrier panel. And these panels are large enough now between three and 500 genes that a, a, a lot of um, donors are going to be carriers. Well, if you're choosing, you might as well know what you carry so that if you're a carrier of cystic fibrosis, well, choose a donor who's negative for it. You might as well lower your reproductive risk. So this is separate. And just because you have genetic carrier screening done and it's all low risk doesn't mean your embryos can't be chromosomally nor abnormal because that's different. That's not looking for a disease mutation. That's just the number of chromosomes an embryo has. Um, someone's asking a question and I'm trying not to get too, too into personal questions. I want to try to make it as applicable to as many people as possible. Someone asked a question about a 40 year old healthy person, um, with an AMH of 1.6 and an AFC of 14 and, and kind of like, what's your prognosis for IVF? In general, that, that's actually reassuring ovarian reserve testing, especially it's above average, I'd say, for 40. Now, there's no guarantee. Somebody can have an AMH of, of four, which is well above average, and not produce an average number of eggs. And someone could have a low AMH and produce above average number of eggs. So there's nothing perfect. I'd say at 40, you have a good chance with that ovarian reserve of responding to the, the fertility drugs of making embryos. A single embryo in a 40-year-old probably, if it's good quality, probably has about a 20% chance of implanting, 20, 25%, but there's a high risk of miscarriage. And so testing the embryos and knowing it's normal first can help reduce that risk. But this is where I think your question goes, you may need to do more than one cycle to get enough embryos to find a, a normal one there. Um, So how a uh, question is, how common are chromosomal anomalies found during PGTA testing? So again, because I know I've thrown this out there and everybody's at a different stage of their journey, PGTA stands for pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy screening. Aneuploidy means the number of chromosomes. Presumably, we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 numbered ones, and then two Xs or an X and Y. And when ovulation occurs and fertilization and the embryos dividing, you can get mistakes in how the DNA divides, which means some embryos are going to end up with extra chromosomes or missing pieces of chromosomes. And this happens to everybody at every age. But as the egg ages, it happens with more frequency. And that's one of the reasons why pregnancy rates decline as the egg reproductively ages. So the likelihood of having abnormal embryos during PGTA testing, again, is related to the age of the egg. So in individuals, in, in, in women who are under the age of 35, probably 20% of your embryos are going to be chromosomally abnormal. If you're under 30, it might be a little bit less than that. Um, 
over the age of 37, you're you're getting closer to 30 to 40 percent. Early 40s, it's probably 40 to 50 percent. I know by the time you're 43 to 45, it can be ha more than half of your embryos. So it's really very related to age. Um, so someone asked, what are questions you should ask your doc when you have a, a, an appointment talking about I IVF? Um, so, you know, uh, some of the things that we've touched on already, you know, having a discussion about the protocol that they're going to use, what's, what's your what's your goal? Um, are you going to uh, do normal insemination of, especially if it's unexplained infertility, are you going to do normal insemination where you just for each egg, take the sperm and incubate it around the egg um, and leave them together overnight to fertilize? Is there a role of doing ICSI off the bat where you take the sperm and you inject it directly into the egg? Um, are you going to plan on doing a fresh transfer? Um, is there a benefit to freezing and doing PGTA depending on um, your age and, and you know, how many children you, you may or may want, not want in the future? Um, trying to think of, of, of what, of what else you should ask. Um, you know, and then standard stuff that I, I, you know, do's and don'ts during the cycle, travel during an IVF cycle. This is when we get questions about all the time. In a perfect world, don't travel. Um, and it's not because it's dangerous, but you know, there's times where you don't want to. When you're being stimulated and you're coming in for a lot of monitoring visits, you don't know when you're going to be ready or when we're maybe going to ask you to come back. So you don't you want to be around during the time you're doing stimulation. Um, if you're doing a fresh transfer, you want to be around until after the transfer and ideally until you know whether or not you're pregnant. Maybe a quick getaway is after the transfer in those 10 days before you have your pregnancy test. But I usually tell people it's not dangerous to travel. It's just if there's a problem, you're early, you're early pregnant and you haven't had your first ultrasound yet. And now you're in Europe and you start bleeding, you have less access to care. And, and that's the thing. It's not that taking that trip is going to be dangerous to you. It's more just making sure you're around your doctor. So I'd ask your clinic, ask how they handle that, kind of what their recommendations are also. Uh, a quick, quick question, and I think this is probably more common and, and, and a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about it. So in situations where a male may have difficulty um, producing a specimen or having timed intercourse, you know, what, what are some ways to help? Um, so, you know, if IUI is appropriate, um, some men where may have more difficulty during pressure during intercourse, just having the IUI and it takes off a little bit of the pressure. Um, but sometimes producing that specimen can be hard too. If it's IVF and you're going through it, I would talk to your clinic about freezing sperm to have a backup. Do it before the IVF cycle. You have frozen sperm there. It takes pressure off so that if the day of the actual retrieval, um, you're unable to, to get a fresh specimen, you know you have sperm there. Your IVF cycle is not ruined. It, in general, depending on the sperm counts, you know, we prefer fresh sperm because it tends to give you more healthy sperm to utilize. You're usually able to do conventional insemination if the numbers are normal without having to do ICSI, but the overall pregnancy rates with frozen or fresh sperm are, are the same. So, you know, that's usually what I, what I recommend in scenarios like that. Um, Somebody asked where I see patients in, in Delaware. So uh, Derm is located, our main office is in Newark, Delaware. We just opened up a new facility on 620 Churchman's Road, down the road from Christiana Hospital. It's beautiful. It's on the third floor, right above the birth center. And I am there. And we I am also in a Concord location or on Concord Pike, which is Route 202 and like just over the Pennsylvania border at that Christiana medical building. Um, I'm at those two sites. And then uh, we also have an office in Milford. Um, I can see patients who are from Milford because I can do the consults virtually. Um, but that office is always available for people to go into if it's more convenient. Um, So quick question here, someone's asking about, you know, secondary infertility. So secondary infertility means you conceived before without any assistance, without any difficulty, and now you're having trouble get, getting pregnant again, especially if you've had multiple children. This is always 
infertility is devastating no matter what. Um, I think this often takes people by surprise because if you had no issues before, what is happening now? And it's common. It's very common. You know, I, I'd say 40 to 50% of couples we see have some form of secondary in, infertility and all the same things could still be wrong. So we, I would go through the same gamut, looking at sperm, looking at eggs, ovarian reserve, looking at the uterus, the tubes. Sometimes it can be natural reproductive aging. Something that was easier to overcome when we were younger can get a little more challenging as we get older um, for both men and women. Um, so that could be part of it or things happen or you had kids and you've got scar tissue or there's a fibroid growing. So whether it's you've never been pregnant before and you're having trouble or geez, you've had four kids and now you're having trouble. If, if it's not happening again, you, you, you qualify for an evaluation. Um, is question here about is letrozole versus Clomid for IUI better is one more likely to lead to pregnancy. You know, I, I don't know if one is necessarily better than the other. I, I, I tend to favor letrozole. I think um, it's, really well tolerated. Um, it doesn't have negative impact on the lining of the uterus or the cervical mucus. It's easy to, to take. Um, I think there were some studies that showed that it may be um, a little bit better than Clomid and more equivocal to, to the, in the shots there. Um, but Clomid has been around forever and ever for decades, and we still use it a lot. So I don't think that there's a right or wrong. My personal preference is I typically start with, with letrozole. Um, someone's asking about polyps and fertility. And again, this is another hard one because we're not looking at every woman that's walking around out there to look for polyps and how many may be fertile and, and conceive when you have polyps in place. We do have some studies, most of them are kind of old, that show that if you have a substantial polyp, about a half a centimeter, uh, yeah, half a centimeter or more, that it has been shown to decrease implantation rates. And I think when you're I think it's rare unless you've got very large or multiple polyps that the polyps are the sole cause of infertility. But if it's going to make it suboptimal, it's going to lower implantation rates. Most of us in this world would just say, let's let's remove it. Let's take them out and normalize the cavity. Um, a, a good percentage of polyps, especially small ones, might resolve on their own over time. But time is not something that most patients experiencing infertility want to waste. Um, there's not a lot of recovery time after a polyp removal. It depends on the size, how your physician does it. Um, someone asked if how soon can you start an IVF cycle? Um, you know, if you're doing a fresh transfer, I usually wait a whole menstrual cycle before I'm going to want to put an embryo in after polyp removal just to let the lining shed again. Um, but it's certainly not months. If you're going to freeze embryos, you could move forward right away with IVF and, and freeze those embryos. Uh, making sure I'm not missing anything. Um, the question here about gender selection, which is a common question and talked about a lot now. The only way you can actually select the sex of your embryo is with IVF, with PGT testing, where you see the chromosomes. And you'll, you can select an embryo that has two X chromosomes or one that has an X and Y chromosome. My biggest caveat that I will tell anybody, especially if you're coming just to do that, there are no guarantees. You could be the most fertile person. There's no guarantees you're going to have the embryo of the sex you want available. Um, so that's just something to keep in your mind. If you go through this and you go through all this, um, just, just to be aware. Now, if you're doing IVF for infertility and you get your PGT results back and there's three great looking embryos and there's one that's the male and two that are females. And you say, listen, I want to transfer the male first. That's, that's, that's fine. I just don't never want someone to think that they're going to be guaranteed to get that, that sex that you want. Now, someone asked a question about how soon after, um, how how soon can you do a transfer after having methotrexate for an ectopic? Um, three months, and, and not just a transfer, even the egg retrieval because of the eggs. So methotrexate, because it affects 
by inhibiting like folic acid, it affects rapidly dividing cells, which the eggs are. And after three months, the eggs that are there then were, were really immature and weren't exposed to the methotrexate. So that's why there's that three month rule, which is really, a I know, a, a bummer. Um, let's see. Um, this is a hard question. At what point do you consider fertility futile, futile? Meaning there's a low chance that you're going to be successful. Is there a transfer limit? When do you stop? This is a really sensitive, and this is a really hard question because, um, it can be hard both for doctors to tell someone that maybe it's time to stop, and it can be really hard for patients to 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 stop. Also, you know, sometimes it's obvious you're trying to stimulate for IVF and you just don't respond no matter what protocol we use, or you respond a little bit, but we're not getting any embryos. And in that case, we know, listen, this is futile. There's no reason to keep stimulating you over and over again if it's not resulting in any usable embryos, right? That's, that's, that's more obvious. Um, it, it's, it's tough. I think it's a discussion that over time, the more I know somebody and kind of know someone's goals and what's been going on, it kind of unfolds as we as we as we move through. Um, I think it's important to have a an honest conversation with someone when 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 you're not not being successful. A transfer limit is hard because it really depends on what that means. What are you transferring? You know, if there's very poor quality embryos, um, especially a woman at, at an older reproductive age, um, then you could say, well, yeah, why, why are we continuing to, to do this? If someone though has had a few transfers and they're either chromosomally normal, they're good quality embryos, and we don't have a reason yet for implantation failure, that's a really tough discussion. It's a very big gray area in our in our field. And I think that deserves kind of a longer conversation about, all right, is there some of this out of the box testing we need to look at? Do I look at using a gestational carrier? What are some of my my options? So it's it's a it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. And I think also it's an emotionally difficult thing in working with a therapist in conjunction with your reproductive endocrinologist may really help you kind of find when you're at that point that you're ready to to, to walk away. Um, let me see if I can answer another one more. Our time is almost up. Uh, someone asked quickly about how their period has changed over the past two years, is shortened, lighter in flow and had miscarriages. And does that mean egg quality is low? You can't tell just by by your menses um, about egg quality because there's so many factors that can affect how your menstrual cycle really looks. I think the best thing to do is to have an evaluation, have your ovarian reserve testing done by blood work, have an ultrasound, look at your uterus. That'll give you more of an answer as to what's as to what's going on, but it does not automatically mean that your um, fertility is low or that your egg quality is low. Um, You know, uh, another quick question, and none of these are quick, but uh, someone asked about how many embryos for a live birth? What about in recurrent pregnancy loss with no cause? Again, it all comes down to quality of embryos. If you have a chromosomally normal, a euploid embryo, or an embryo in someone who's under the age of 35, I would say after two to three transfers, 80 to 90% of people are going to be pregnant, have an ongoing pregnancy. Recurrent pregnancy loss is a whole nother bucket, but in recurrent pregnancy loss, when there isn't infertility associated with it, the majority of couples will eventually go on to have a live birth, even if we don't do anything. Recurrent pregnancy loss and infertility on top of it is really tough. I think IVF with genetically tested embryos and ruling out any other causes is your best chance there. So that hour went really fast. I know I talked really fast and I hope I got the majority of um, everyone's questions answered. Um, and please, you know, give us a call here at, at Boston IVF and, and, and we'd be happy to talk to anybody. And thanks for spending an hour of your evening with me.